you join me in the air. I find flying is nowhere near as fast as it initially seems. Train journeys to the airport, security queues, being made to queue on a staircase whilst all the low-cost airline staff police you for a bag that's an inch too girthy. All of a sudden it's not an hour and a half journey after all. But sometimes it is a better option than the train or driving. I wish there was a good overnight sleeper train in London to Edinburgh, and the Caledonian doesn't count. This is Granton Harbour. Alan plans to visit there soon. Our condolences to the harbour in advance. And we landed, which is good news to start off with. What's emerging from the hatch? Me, of course, with nothing else of consequence. We're up on deck this episode, and loyal viewers will recall this bucket of water, which is sadly no longer in situ. I want to put some additional storage up here for lightweight and indeed very long and thin stuff. The two main issues is that we still need standing and walking space here, and also the driver needs to have unobstructed views forward. We can't have it coming up too high. This means I cannot make it vast, and instead I've carefully spent time heading back inside, out, back in again, to work out at what height a storage zone would begin to impede the view of Alan's helmsman over his bulbous bow. Now for some planed timber. I considered using GRP mouldings for this, but struggled with availability and sizing, so reliable old trees it is. I make sure the lengths are still straight, as it's shocking how many timber merchants are happy to sell twisted and warped stock to customers. On deck, we can size up the various lengths. I want to get the balance right. Too wide, and I'll not be able to walk either side within the railings. Too narrow, and it's a wasted opportunity for storage, and it'll not be able to accommodate something mounted on top. This is what I opted for, and a couple of the lengths need to head down for cutting. We're going for a little over 2 metres long, and a little over 50 centimetres wide, Given the internal vertical dimension will be 11 centimetres exactly, this is a pretty substantial amount of wet storage that will help unclutter Alan's innards. In fact, over 120 litres of storage. I'm specifically cutting the shorter crossbeams short so that there's a gap on either side. Trying to waterproof this storage would be a fool's errand, so I'm leaving it as an easy drain area. Nothing up there should be bothered about getting wet. And it'll be easy to rinse out with fresh water from time to time. It's never too late in the evening to listen to some history podcasts and do some wood treatment. It's wood. There's not much wood employed aboard Alan, so it'll need some serious attention to keep it healthy for years to come. I'm starting by drenching it with preservative, the sort that really soaks in. Then, once totally dry, I'm doing a base coat of epoxy two-part paint. And if he was tall, if he was conflicted, he was clearly managing to hide it. In some this should seal the wood effectively, and along with yet more history podcasts, readies it for a final couple of coats of marine exterior gloss paint. The sun is out again. You'll have noticed this episode spans a number of months of on and off work, but just on time, my prepared and treated planks are ready to be deployed up top. And there's more. Atop the lid of this storage zone will be more solar. I'm actually due to swap out the current flexible panels as I've not been very happy with them. But to bolster the new flexible array's photovoltaic efforts, I've added this pair of 100 watt rigid panels. They're heavy and less flexible than flexible ones, but if you don't need a super low profile or flex, they are cheaper and apparently last a lot longer. Hold on to the thought of those panels of sunny goodness though. First, I need to bed those planks in. At first, I just used beads of mastic adhesive to keep them in line, but of course we need a lot more strength. So I'm running a few strips of glass fibre tape along the inner edges in a right angle, and then using resin to wet those out and get a reasonable bond. It won't be cosmetically perfect in there without time to fill, fair, sand and so on, although I did run over with some coarse emery cloth after it cured, to take off any knobbly bits and check that there was no bridging under the laminate. Finally, a coat of standard single component topside paint in a colour that's supposed to match Alan's main paint job, but I found to be more of an approximation. Anyhow, it'll keep it glossy and bright inside there, and easy to rinse and wipe clean. Before we do the lid, a message from, well, me, in a car. Right, so today is the 7th of May, and you may note that's a very important day. It's one that I put aside for launching Alan onto the water for the start of uh, leg two. And unfortunately, uh, we've had to cancel. A whole load of things didn't arrive on time, and so I've been delayed, and we've had even for the, um, the standards of this part of the country, we've had ridiculous weather this, um, uh, this winter and spring uh, with just torrential rain almost without end. So for that reason, I have delayed the lift and I'm going to try and do another four solid days work. And by solid, I really mean it. I mean 12, 13, 14 hours because I need to be quite efficient with my time up here. Uh, it'll be worth it. I'm a bit disappointed because I had arranged a really good uh, crewmate and we had all of our dates booked in and the weather looked okay actually for the actual passage. 
and uh, luckily he's been really understanding and we should be able to re-schedule, uh, but yeah. Well, the ocean's loss is Alan's shore-based gain for now, and now for the lid. I just got my pen. Anyway. I think I may need to overdub this, as it was an Alan! windy day. Basically, I found a Sharpie I'd lost weeks before and ended up with this multi-wall polycarbonate sheet plus a couple of lengths of aluminium U-channel edging to fit the two sides. We'll bond it on. For that, I'm starting a tube of that mastic I bought for filling the gap under the rubber fender strip around Allen and ended up with some left over. We can be liberal here and run a good bead along the two lengths. Plonking the polycarb in is no great drama, although once it's placed and bashed in so we have a tight fit, I intentionally had it an inch proud one end and an inch short the other, that means that with a few taps, I can shift it along so that both ends are flush, and in doing so, ensure the mastic gunge is spread out along the maximum surface area under there. No idea if this is a professional adhesive tip, but I force it upon you anyhow. It cured, and here I must apologise for the limited footage in the next bit. I was working at such a pace to meet the previous launch deadline that I've just informed you that I subsequently shifted right a week or two that I didn't film all the stages. But in short, I've put the lid on, placed hinges on one side and clips on the other, both able to release so the lid can be removed for maintenance and fix the two solar panels to the lid. The cables will run captive inside the frames backwards to meet the electrical junction box. A useful addition to Allen, I hope you'll agree, but I do need to add rounded protectors to all four corners so ankles are safe from attack. There's space to walk all around, either inside or outside of the railings. I also needed to reposition the rubber bumper for the front hatch that can be flung back for anchoring and other bow tasks. The new enlarged bow hatch window necessitates this. I prepped the fiberglass with a milli grinder, used plenty of sealant, and then clamped it down with three chunky stainless screws. Oh, and a final note. Don't be tempted by the budget lines of otherwise good quality power tools companies. My Einheld drill died after years of sterling service, and I replaced it with an Ozito, owned by the same company and using the same batteries. But the chuck is useless and cannot grip the bits properly. False economy. Don't do it. Bye.